from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello and welcome to the National Book Festival. I am Nora Krug and I am about to lose my folder. Um, I am a book world editor at the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the festival. Um, and if you've made it to this hour with children, I hope you've had time for a nap. Um, <laughs> I know I was thinking this was late, but we have the book for you. Um, <laughs> um, the Napping House, as most of you here probably know, is one of the um, classic, become a kind of a classic children's book. I know I read it to my children when they were um, in the napping stage, which is sadly past. Um, but it was first published in 1984, and now, more than 30 years later, we have the full moon at the Napping House, which I know we're going to hear more about. Um, it's, I, I'm going to let them tell you, but it's, uh, it's sort of the opposite of what happens in the Napping House, um, they, um, <laughs> about how they fall asleep and the bed breaks, but this uh, begins differently. Um, anyway, Audrey and Don have um, teamed up on numerous other books um, as well, including Piggies, Quick as a Cricket, and the Caldecott Honor uh, book, King Bid Goods in the Bathtub. Um, and they enviously live both in California and in Hawaii. Um, and it is in Hawaii that um, their new book, uh, they found the inspiration for their newest book, but I know that they're eager to tell you more about that themselves. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. It's such a delight to be here and share with you our passion for writing and illustrating children's books and the fun that we have doing it too. It's traditional for authors and illustrators in a venue like this to read their children's picture book. Well, we're going to go one up on that for the first time in the history of children's literature. We're not going to read one children's picture book. We're going to read two <laughs> simultaneously. Now, why, why would we pull such a stunt? It's because the Napping House had to wait 30 years to find its best friend, its new companion. The full moon at the Napping House. This book and that book will be read simultaneously so that we can show you two aspects of this book and its companion. The first aspect is how similar they are. They have a very parallel structure. The second aspect is how inverted the themes are. As Nora mentioned, this book starts sleepy and it wakes up. And the full moon at the napping house starts very excited and restless and it calms down. It's just exactly opposite. And then the, the illustrations are different too. From this each book, book occurs in the daytime. Napping house and the full moon happens at nighttime. So everything's opposite. So the, uh, the, the key word of that introduction was that we will attempt this reading. It's never been done before. You are guinea pigs. <laughs> this is it. Are you ready, Audrey? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I think you begin first. You're right. <laughs> there is a house, a napping house, where everyone is sleeping. There is a house. A full moon house where everyone is restless. <laughs> and in that house, there is a bed, a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And in that house, there is a bed, a wide awake bed in a full moon house where everyone is restless. And in that bed, there is a granny, a snoring granny in a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And in that bed there is a granny, a sleepless granny, in a wide awake bed in a full moon house where everyone is restless. And on that granny there is a child, a dreaming child on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And with that granny, there is a child, a fidgety child, with a sleepless granny in a wide awake bed in a full moon house where everyone is restless. 
And on that child there is a dog, a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And with that child there is a dog, a playful dog, with a fidgety child, with a sleepless granny, in a wide awake bed, in a full moon house where everyone is restless. And on that dog there is a cat, it's a snoozing cat, on a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed, in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And with that dog there is a cat, a prowling cat, with a playful dog, with a fidgety child, with a sleepless granny, in a wide awake bed, in a full moon house where everyone is restless. And on that cat there is a mouse, a slumbering mouse, on a snoozing cat, on a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And with that cat there is a worried mouse, with a prowling cat, with a playful dog, with a fidgety child, with a sleepless granny, in a wide awake bed, in a full moon house where everyone is restless. And on that mouse there is a flea. Can it be a wakeful flea on a slumbering mouse, on a snoozing cat, on a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping? Where everyone is restless until a chirping cricket sings his song to the worried mouse and the prowling cat and the playful dog and the fidgety child and the sleepless granny in a wide awake bed in the full moon house where everyone is restless. A wakeful flea who bites the mouse. A chirping cricket who sings a song that soothes the mouse. Who scares the cat. Who calms the cat. Who claws the dog. Who gentles the dog. Who thumps the child. Who snuggles the child. Who bumps the granny. Who hugs the granny. Who breaks the bed. In the dreamy house. In the napping house where no one now is sleeping. In the full moon house where no one now is restless. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> wow. You got it. Woo. That's a, a death defying reading. Uh, we are going to present to you for the remainder of our presentation uh, portions of presentations that we'll be giving for the next three weeks around the country. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt has generously put us onto a tour. We'll be performing at schools, libraries, and bookstores. Of course, this uh, presentation that we will be giving will be oriented to children in those venues. So uh, those of you who are children, you're in the right place at the right time. Those of you who are not, let's keep in mind the young at heart maxim and see if you can handle that. The information is somewhat simplified. It will be how we work, the systems that we have evolved to wrestle with the complex problems of creating simple picture books, uh, art and writing both. Now these tips and techniques will be simplified for our, our uh, children's venue, but they are very, very accurate. Mm -hmm. And these tips are also used by children. Too. True, that's yes. the point. So one of the questions that I get wherever I go as an author is, well, where do you get your ideas from? And everyone just thinks they come out of the air, you know, and then they float around and they come down in my head and then, oh, I have an idea and it's done. Well, it's not exactly that way. Here's what I do. Every morning when I wake up, I tell myself to be idea hungry. Now, what does idea hungry mean? You know what hungry means, okay. So to be idea hungry, I'm going to watch my environment. I'm gonna see what's really happening. I'm gonna notice things. And I'm also gonna watch my internal environment. That means my emotions, what make, how I feel. Let's say that I'm at the playground and I hear a joke or someone does something funny and that makes me laugh, that makes me happy. Well, that's an emotion. And so I, I actually, 
pay, pay very close attention to that because I know that that little thing that happened or whatever made me laugh is, is could lead to a story. So I write it down. Now the same thing goes with feelings like sadness. Um, if I'm on the playground and something, something sad happens or I hear or see something, uh, then I take note of that. I, I, I understand that that could be an important uh, story lead also, and I write it down. So um, when I first started writing children's books, uh, I just knew that I wanted to write them because when I was in the fourth grade, I began, that's when I started writing stories, although I didn't get them published for many years, I wanted to write them. So um, I just decided, I had a bookstore, and I decided that I would, uh, hey, I'm, I'm supposed to be writing books. And I told Don, and we closed our bookstore, and within a year, I pretty much followed my dream and with my passion and was able to get there. Um, so I had no training, really, for writing at all. My training was strictly drama. Drama, oh, yeah, some sort of dramatic, yeah. Um, so when I, when I had this desire to do this, I read books and, you know, books we cannot live without. Books you can do anything in the world with. If you, whatever you want to do, you read a book and it's going to tell you how to do it. So the book said, as an author, I'm supposed to keep, keep files. And um, that means you keep files on, long files on uh, um, themes, plots, uh, ideas, uh, everything you can think of, a uh, title, and you, you keep them very organized. So I kept organized files. And after four books published, I, I opened up my files and they were so full. Ooh, I, they were so cumbersome. Ooh, I couldn't use my imagination. They were, they were, they were big and overflowing and, and I, they, they seemed to keep me from doing what I needed to do. So out of frust frustration, and there it is off stage right there, I got a box. And what I did, I went into my, my files, I made a box that I became known to me as the idea box. I painted it up, and I took all my files, I opened them up, and oh, here's the wrong one, but here it is right here. And I just dumped everything in there, like that. Just lots and lots of things, everything, whatever, all went into this box right here. I no longer had everything filed easily. So then what happens after that is that I learned that I could also put such things in my ideas box as, well, these are my two most important tools. So that would be a sketchbook, because I'm an illustrator also, and a notebook. So I could put those in there. I could also put three-dimensional items because it's a big box, it's not a file, and this little fellow could give me an idea. Uh, so I would put it in there. And of course, anything, anything I want to put in there, like drawings and, oh, I go to a store and, you know, I love jelly beans, so, oh, oh my goodness, that's, that's an idea. I'll just put it right in there. So as you could see, my idea box was full of all kinds of different things. And, but how does an idea box work? Well, this is how it works. I'm, I'm so lucky to travel with an illustrator because he, he draws everything I'm talking about. <laughs> when she starts talking, I have to start drawing. He does. It's an illuminated, illuminated speech. So what I would do, I, in my studio, I do not have a desk. I'm one of these people who writes better in a bed with my legs stretched out and my... Um, my animal next to me, my little friend, and at the time he drew that, it was a cat, but now it's a bull mastiff, so it's, she's a little bit bigger. Oh dear, but anyway, they're very helpful. So what I do, I take all the ideas that are in here, I've forgotten them, you know, because they, they could be a whole year's worth of little, little ideas and things, and I begin to spread them around. And this is an idea or imagination generator for me. This allows me to, to just let, to dream, you know, and I cross-reference them, and I start, begin to, oh, you know, I take this an idea and this little, little bit. Keep in mind, I really want you to understand that these are not stories. These are simply bits and pieces of ideas that lead to stories. And this is, a, for me, it's an, um, a story generator. Speaking of generating stories, yes. why don't you be specific and tell mm. us how 
the full moon at the napping house was generated in the idea box. Well, I don't remember. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> That's a shame. I've got some drawings here. <laughs> I tell you, it's great to have him along. Uh, okay, The Napping House. The Napping House, after it was published, what happened is that uh, it became a, um, a favorite of teachers and, and preschool children and up to elementary, and we'd get a lot, of, a lot of letters, people asking us to write, us, me to write a second book. And the children came up with all these wonderful ideas, and they were so imaginative, and I loved them, and I thought about them. I would put some of them in my idea box, and then I would sit, you know, I would, maybe I should try this. And all these different types of napping house ideas that could come along, but none of them ever resulted in a story for me. At the time, we lived in, in California, and there was a, um, uh, you couldn't see the moon because there was a marine layer. That means there was every night the fog, foggy sky. So I never really noticed the moon. I knew the moon was there and the stars, but I never really saw it. Then a marvelous thing happened. Uh, how many years later was that? 27 Something years. 20, 27 <laughs> years later. Um, we moved to Hawaii. Everything changed. Um, I could see the stars and the moon. It was so beautiful, the different phases from very small to full moon. And I, it was just so different, a, a different experience. And I had, I, what I discovered was that I was restless. I was restless during the full moon. And so was my, my bull mastiff. And so I would take her out for walks and it was so bright there. And when I got outside, I found out that, that I wasn't the only restless one, and she wasn't the only restless one. There were other restless animals outside. Uh, you can see that we have two pet goats, and they were, would butt their heads together like this and run around and chase each other. And then the, the, the wild geese that usually just sleep quietly at night, they're flying around the property, honking, making all these, this noise. And, and, and then we have 21 pet chickens, and um, they flew the coop and, during the full moon, and they would be out pecking on the ground thinking it was nighttime and um, just having a, a wonderful time. So again, being idea hungry as an author, experiencing this and being outside, one night on the full moon, I thought, well, gosh, what would it be like to have a full moon shining down on the napping house? You know, and so immediately when I went back inside, I wrote that down and put it in my idea box as, as oh, that excites me because it was my experience, you know. Don and I have only worked, uh, lived in two houses together, and this was, the, it was So exciting. that was, as you mentioned, a bit and a piece of an idea. There was it wasn't still the whole story. There was a major obstacle. That's true. It, I had a big challenge because in the napping house, as some of you may know, there's a, it's very calm. You heard it was very calm. All the characters are asleep, and the, the the top character that wakes up all the other characters bites the mouse and wakes up every single character. You know, but in the full moon at the napping house, I needed a a magical sort of night character that would calm everyone down because all the characters that were in the napping house were very restless. So that, was, that proved to be a challenge. Um, it was difficult for me to find a character, that, a night character that seemed to work. I almost gave up the project of working on it. I thought about a bat, but that seemed way too spooky <laughs> for the napping house. And, and finally, one night, I was, um, again, a full moon night. Um, I was taking Nisha, my dog, outside. And just as we walked outside, I heard a sound. And that sound was a chirping cricket that was in the corner. And immediately, it just, my mind went back to when I was a, a child. I was also restless growing up during full moons, evidently, because I remember that my mother, I could hear my mother saying, well, if you can't sleep on a full moon, uh, listen, and there's a cricket chirping, make a wish on it, and your wish will come true. And I just went, oh, cricket, of course. How many times did I do that when I was a child? So I, 
after our walk and everything, um, I brought I brought Nisha back inside and wrote it down, threw it in the idea box, and, and I found is. my character. It and was a cricket. That's how the idea box helped generate Full Moon at the Napping House. Yes. Now I'm going to face this at the camera because I'm afraid some of you over there won't be able to see it. Maybe if I stand And up. I'm going to do a little illustration talk. In fact, quite a few of you can't see it. Let me scoot it up a bit. Try not to fall off the ledge. So, I am a narrative artist. Yeah. That means I tell stories with my art. This is what I was from the very start. I always drew stories in the fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, all stories, all the time. Unfortunately, when I got into higher education for a number of years, I forgot that. And I had to be reminded of the role my art was supposed to play in this world when I met Audrey, who reminded me that I was meant to tell stories with my art. Now, the most important thing when you're telling stories with your art is to generate interest, which is based upon empathy, in my characters. I have to have you guys feeling along with my characters. Now, I know that a lot of you children have favorite characters that you draw over and over, and oftentimes they're always similar. They may be neutral, they may be happy, they may be angry, but I'm going to show you how to give them emotions. These are the tricks that we illustrators use to create emotions in our characters. And you can use these too. And they're definitely for kids. And I'm going to draw the cat that's outside in the flower garden of the napping house. So we're going to start with the easiest emotion of all, which is happy. Now we draw an up mouth, up, eyes, eyebrows. Never forget the eyebrows. Big, full ears, nice, full fur, furry, happy, round face. Now we have a happy face. One of the things you have to know as an illustrator that your body language must match your face. We have to have a happy body with a happy face. So we'll draw a nice, relaxed, at ease cat body here with this face. Nice and furry and out there like that. And of course, the tail will go up as well, and furry and big. Now, one thing you may not think about, and if you look back in the history of painting, artists have been doing this trick forever. The environment matches the mood of the character. So, she's in, the cat's in the flower garden, and the flower garden is full of happy, healthy flowers. Another thing you may not think about, and you look back, Renaissance, medieval, <laughs> the sky always matches the mood. Doesn't really make sense, but you know, you're in charge of this art world that you're creating. So it's going to be fluffy, round, happy clouds. Now, that's up. The opposite of up is down. The opposite of happy is sad. We'll do down. The down cat. Don't forget eyebrows. And look at the ears are so down that they. Now we have to do the, the slumped, sad body. And the tail is so depressed. It, and of course, oh, I forgot the whiskers on the first one. They were up too. Now they're down. Of course, there's always one thing that goes Aww. down. But don't feel sorry for the cat. Wait till you see the flowers. Uh, <laughs> The flowers are wilted and dehydrated. And how about our sky? What kind of weather would we have? <laughs> Dark clouds, sad, down. Now we're going to take one more quick <gasps> emotion. It's much more complicated and much more interesting. <gasps> Is the universal emblem of surprise. Why? Why does everyone do that? It's involuntary, meaning you don't even mean to do it. Something pops up in front of you. <gasps> Lungs filled with oxygen. Fight or flight. You have to either defend yourself or run as fast as you can. For that, you need oxygen. What else do you need? Information. 
you need to open your eyes to see what it is has popped up in front of you. Now your eyebrows always follow the eyes. Mm -hmm. Then the ears, they're wide open because they have to hear anything they can. The body kind of spreads out when it's surprised. Then the whiskers are out there to catch everything they can. Now watch my body. Illustrators pay attention to this stuff and then we exaggerate it. <gasps> Everything goes up and my neck stretches up, so we cartoonists exaggerate that, like that. And there is the surprised cat whose body is rising up. Then all of this stuff just sort of explodes outward. And the tail, a zoom, and of course the flowers are like, wow! <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, we'll make her clear off the ground. I hadn't thought of that before. Here's the flowers all there. And the clouds, of course, surprise clouds would be flying in all directions. So tips, actual real live illustrator tips you can use. And you adults can use this too. I know, you know, I doodle on the phone. So yeah, everyone uses this. Time for questions. Now we have a mic apparently, which makes it so much easier because we'll be able to hear the questions. Is there a, a person who would like to ask a question of any age? We'll take questions from adults. How did you start to draw? I'm sorry? How did you start to draw? Obsessive. Uh, I have no idea. I was in a small farming community. There wasn't another artist for a hundred miles around. And I told my parents I was going to be an artist, and they rightfully were very disturbed because <laughs> this was a long time ago, and artists traditionally starved. So uh, I started drawing. I'll tell you something very quick. I had, there were three people in my class that could draw, and I wasn't the best. Junior could draw hot rods, Stephanie could draw horses, and I was not a specialist in anything, but they kind of burned out because they could only draw one thing. I learned to draw everything, and that kept me interested, and I became an artist. So if you're interested in art, tr you know, try and draw everything. I'm an artist, too. And I anything that it's difficult to draw, just keep trying, you know? Okay, Don't next question. Don't get stuck on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Stephanie, and I was wondering if you guys have made any novels? I have a lot of novels <laughs> that are in of... my idea box, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's just that I, picture books are very difficult to write because they have to appeal. They're, it's like writing poetry or poems, and I find them so challenging that every time I start a novel, I don't finish it. You and know, what does it turn into? It turns into a picture book. Somehow, <laughs> I'm just, it, I'm, I'm going away writing a novel, and all of a sudden, here comes a picture book, and I, I'm going, oh, I'm goody, 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 because they're very, very One of these days. To write. Mm -hmm. You watch. Yeah, and one thing I want to say is that, that uh, picture books have to appeal to both children and adults, you know, because some children wouldn't hear a book unless it's read to them. And so that, that's a challenge, a real challenge in, in writing picture books. Next mm -hmm. question. Um, how many books do you write? How many have we written? Well, I think there's about 60 by now. Yeah. And She's much more prolific yeah, than me. Yeah, I also illustrate, and I have a very different style than Don. So we can, what, whatever I write, you know, we sort of look at it together and decide that maybe he will do it, or maybe I will do it, or maybe somebody else will do it. Good question, though. So, I didn't you. know the answer to that. Yeah. That's a lot. We've Next been doing question. this a long time. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Paulette. Um, Growing up, Sweet Dream Pie was one of my favorite books. Oh, thank it you. was like really big in my childhood. So how did you develop your ideas for that book? Sweet Dream Pie. Well, like, it was kind of came from this jelly bean thing. <laughs> <laughs> really, it did. Um, I understand that, that uh, you know, the problem with, because I've experienced it in life experience, um, uh, what happens when I eat too much sugar, you know, I might get a little bit, uh, you remember Mr. Bream? Yes, what? We had a neighbor. Oh, yes, he ate. He, he made sweet dream he, pie. He, he, he loved to eat very sweet pies. Everything. And he had it, nightmares. They were this big. So that was accumulation of ver several different things, watching children, watching myself, uh, watching our neighbor who would love to have a sweet dream pie. He was from Germany. And, but uh, he always had nightmares for a week after his, his wife made them. <laughs> and I, when she baked, it was so hot, you could feel it outside the house. Yeah, yeah. 
So this was our neighbor. They were bigger. Thank you. They were mythic neighbors, larger than life. So the, hence, I think we have time for one more, perhaps. One more, one more question, please. Sorry Hi, about. Hi, my name is Alex, and my Hi. question is, how do you make your books? Ah, all right. It's a long process. Thirty-one years for this one. Most of them don't take that long. Uh, Audrey begins. It's always the word first. Mm -hmm. The story comes first. Yeah. A and sh what? Thirty revisions, forty revisions, yeah. five yeah. months, a year, These seven years ideas. for Albert's bad mm -hmm. word. Uh, it, it's a long, long process. But then, she, oh, excuse me, go ahead. You draw dummies. Yes. Then she passes it to me, yeah. and I do something that probably you do as well. I make little rough books, and they, I actually staple them together. And you have to, you know, you turn the pages, and I use stick figures of all things to start with, and then it gets better and better, and sometimes we'll produce 20 dummies, an interesting thing, and the advantage that we have mm -hmm. is that usually the artist and the illustrator are on different coasts or different countries. Well, she gives me the words, and then I create the dummy and give it back to her, and then she changes the words, and she gives it back to me, and I change the dummy. Our books go through a long process. partnership process that I think that is mm -hmm. crucial. Yeah, and the writing for me, people always know, how long does it take you? Well, six months to 15 years. <laughs> you know, I can have that many revisions. I have many, many revisions in my stories. And how long does it take you to illustrate a book? A year to a year and a half. A year to a year and a half. Some of them. Uh, you know, seven yeah. days, 12 hours mm -hmm. a day. I'm sorry to those of you who are Thank lined up. You. Perhaps we can come by and say hello on our way out and maybe answer go. a few questions personally, but we do have to make room for our next presenter. Are we on yes. time? We'll wrap up, she says. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.